I have been asked to give you a, a short condensed overview of the future and what are the main trends in the future, like three to five years ahead, uh, because it's very hard to look ahead in the future. So uh, one of my favorite quotes is this one from Bill Gates. We always overestimate the change that is going to occur in uh, the coming two years, and we underestimate, uh, underestimate what's going to happen in the next 10. So um, looking back to my uh, childhood, when they were asking me, late 60s, early 70s, uh, in, in primary school, what, what is going to happen in the future? How do you see the future in the year 2000, which was then pretty far away? Uh, we all were drawing, uh, drawing um, flying cars. Most of the boys at least did. So, uh, but then if you look at actually what is happening, there is still no flying cars, but then the computer took over and technology took over many of the, of the business and innovation. So many of you remember this phone, the Nokia Communicator, which was released in 1999. And then I was working in Finland, uh, and we were servicing uh, Nokia. And I remember how excited we were, because this phone could actually go on the internet. You had an internet browsing function, and we had all these ideas of how we're going to be able to personalize and distribute information and all that. But it still took eight to nine years until the iPhone came with its uh, app ecosystem even a year later and then followed by Andro to disrupt an entire you know, business or lots of businesses and change the way we actually consume technology. But few of us could actually also see that we could have interfaces like Google Glass to interact with uh, digital. So, or even 3D printing or technologies like that that are around now. So it's really hard to look 10 years ahead. So to demonstrate this, I'm going to show you a short video of Discovery Channel of 1992, how they were seeing the future in 2000 on wearable technology. Now have computer hardware that you can literally wear. Ladies and gentlemen, Welcome to this evening's preview of the 2003 Spring Summerwear Collection from the House of NEC. We call this collection Dressing for Texas. Hiroshi sports the latest information system in a stunning yellow and black ensemble. Rom shoulder pads are back again this year, and Michiko accessorizes with style. Michiko again looking fabulous in an interesting off the shoulder data terminal. And this little number is the lap body. It's the laptop you can wear standing up. Isn't this funny? Yeah, so there's hardly anything of that uh, that we use actually 10 years later, yeah? So, uh, people always ask me, like, how do you predict the future? How do you see the future? How do you get all this information? Uh, I think it's because I'm connected to a network of really smart people and that we can discuss about these things on a daily basis. So, I published this book earlier this year, which is called Shift 2020, where I asked uh, main contributors, like 75 people that I respect in the industry, different industries uh, to give their vision on the future in 2020. So uh, for the tweeters among you, if you like to tweet uh, about these presentations or things you see in the presentation, use the tag SHIFT2020, and I'm happy to send you an e-copy uh, of an e-book uh, later on. So, but before we go into trends, I'd like to give you a short overview of what's, what is going on, like all the changes that are happening. Yeah? So the last 20 years, we have been moving from atoms to bits, uh, from analog to digital, and basically the old models, the old business models don't really work anymore in this new environment. So there's lots of changes ahead. So the main thing is also that everything becomes digital. Digital becomes the default. Yeah, so I remember 10 years ago, even further away, we always had to fight against basically people that were a bit uh, anxious about digital and all that. Well, now everybody's connected, mainly through the mobile technology and the mobile phone. 
So uh, software is literally eating the world, as Mark Andreessen uh, pointed out a couple of years ago. So the nature of technology is also exponential. Yeah? So if you look at all the projects or the startups that are actually growing very fast, it's because they use technology and then they go in a specific niche market and then everything goes exponential upwards. Look at the App Store downloads from Apple. Yeah, it's an exponential curve that uh, they have now over 50 billion downloads already. Uh, Cisco predicts in 2020 or 2025, 50 billion devices connected, yeah, from wearables, sensors, things like that, IoT. Mobile video, look at this curve. Yeah, thanks to LTE and the work that you are doing with communications, this is a huge curve. Mobile phones, more and more communication will become visual, about images, video, and all that is going to go forward. We are only here. Oh, it doesn't seem to work, this one, anyway. So um, 3D printing, another of the most ex very exciting technologies, is also going in an upwards curve. So all these are exponentially growing now. We are in a tremendous accelerating pace of innovation. It's actually an S-curve, yeah, so because the expansion curve happens in the middle. Once you go back up, that you have a major market, it's already time to start thinking about something else or innovating something else. So, but as uh, Gary Hamel puts it, the we're in the first generation in history that has to cope with an accelerated rate of change. Yeah, we have never seen, we have never been in this environment, in this period, where there's so much accelerated change. Uh, if you look at it from a business perspective, in Fortune 500, almost 50% of the companies that made the list in 1999 are not here anymore 10 years later. Yeah, so many of them uh, have not been able to cope with this change. Companies who are not able to deal with that or to adapt, they basically disappear or get, get out of business. A good example is Kodak. Yeah, in 1999, had a, uh, a valuation of over 30 billion. And in 2005, they went bankrupt. Does anybody know what's the best-selling camera now? It's the GoPro. The GoPro is currently the best-selling camera. It's the device that you can basically connect uh, anywhere on your wrist, on your helmet, that is used by lots of sportsmen, uh, surfers, uh, people who love extreme sports, you know, the guys who fly from the, rocket, from the rocks and all that. So uh, this is now the best-selling camera. Only seven years after the iPhone, there's over 20 billion dollar companies, yeah? mobile internet companies. Yeah, mainly the chat companies, the Twitter, WhatsApp, Uber, Snapchat, Dropbox, Lime, uh, and some others. So that's a huge valuation that is created in only a couple of years' time, thanks to mobile. China became the world's largest smartphone market in last year. It's a huge market, and they love smartphones. Africa is now the second largest mobile market, and all these people are going to be connected to smartphones also by the end of this decade. Yeah, so a kid with a smartphone in Africa has access to more information than the president of the US 15 years ago. So at the, on the same time, there's also what I call the wow generation, which is a generation of entrepreneurs that are basically using connectivity and the network to solve problems locally, often in emerging countries, uh, and they are very well connected and they solve problems day by day. There's lots of these startups around. They are fueled by crowdfunding. Yeah, crowdfunding is already over a $5 billion market. There's over 100 crowdfunding websites for nonprofits, for businesses, for startups, for projects, creatives, uh, anybody with an idea can basically get his project funded. So we are moving, as Forrester calls it, from the age of manufacturing through the age of distribution, the age of information through the age of the customer. The customer is in power. The customer decides, he gives his opinion on a product, he gives his opinion on a brand, whether he likes it or not, and he can now also create his own products with 3D printing. So lots of changes ahead. The other one, the important thing is that we live in a mobile-centric world. Yeah? Since the smartphone came up, the industry has, has changed a lot. This was 2005, this is now. 
Yeah, so this is only a couple of years, and everybody is now broadcasting his life on the internet. Yeah? Ericsson predicts 9.2 billion mobile subscriptions by the end of this decade, yeah? and over which 80% which will be mobile broadband, and lots of growth in the Middle East and Asia. So many of these apps are actually the most popular or messaging apps like WhatsApp, WeChat, Snapchat. Uh, this is front back. Uh, they are actually using, in, instead of text, they are now using images and more and more also videos. We live in a world where any picture can be shared millions of times. This is an example of Michelle Fan. She has a YouTube channel for a makeup YouTube channel on YouTube where she has two and a half million subscribers checking that channel on a daily basis. Yeah, so there's people anywhere in the world can start a business using mobile or using technology. Uber. Many of you have heard about Uber or have used the, the service already, hopefully. So uh, they are very contradictionary also in, in, in Europe, mainly in Europe, because they are disrupting it, the taxi business. But I think what they do is, uh, is really great. It's essential because what they do is they improve the customer experience for the user. Yeah, so with one click on your mobile phone, you can basically get a driver. He knows where you are. He comes and picks you up. You have your car details already in here. You don't need to worry about payments or cash. Uh, you can get your invoice straight to an email, and you can even share yeah, your cab ride with somebody else, all from within the app. It's about owning the moment. I decide with my phone what I want to do, and I'm, it's my remote control to the world. Another example is Two Nights Going Out app, Yplan from London. They launched one year and a half ago in London. Now they're in New York, San Francisco, Las Vegas, and other cities. Uh, and I'll have a short video. That Again, it's all controlled from within the app. So you can basically sp uh, scroll for events. You can invite your friends or ask them if they want to join. And then when they want to join, you just order the tickets. And it's all from the in in the within the app. So these type of apps are the winners of today. Yeah? So they are basically growing fast because the new generation, they love these things all from within the app. They reduce the friction for the user. Yeah? So Another one is Airbnb, which most of you know. Yeah, so they have a valuation of over 10 billion already, which is more than Hyatt Regency, or most of the biggest hotel groups in the world. Hyatt Regency owns 147,000 rooms. They own them. Airbnb doesn't own anything. They have just 500,000 rooms available on their platform that they sell, and they just take a tra uh, commission on the transaction. So the platforms, the people who have the platform who can enable uh, better service for the customers, they are the winners. Other ones are Task Rad, uh, Rabbit, which is basically you can order anyone for any type of task at home uh, to come and do it. And there's others like People Per Hour, and there's a whole wave of startups in that area. So I could go on for another hour or two in showing you apps, but there's a lot more to show. So what do they all have in common is that it all generates a lot of data. Yeah, all this mobile, these devices, the smartwatches that are coming in, the wearables, all this information is all going through the pipeline and can be analyzed by companies yeah, about the customer's behavior and then actually the companies who can prepare or serve better the customer analyzing this data. Uh, it will, this will also go a bit... Um, the backside is that we will have you know, issues with privacy, and in lots of countries there will be big debates about uh, privacy, and some companies will have to review their uh, terms and conditions on privacy uh, with the customer constantly. So let's look at education. Many of you heard about massive open online courses, the MOOCs, Coursera, Udemy. There's lots of them where basically anyone 
with some knowledge to, 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 to distribute, can create a course and then sell that online. Yeah, and then do a one-to-many course that can be consumed by many people at the same time. The CAN Ad Academy, is they, their mission is to provide the entire population with free information. All the knowledge in the world, they want to provide that for free on the app or on the internet. How can you compete with that? So uh, Skype has also an interesting technology coming up. Uh, it's going to be released before the end of the year, which is Skype Translator which is also going to be very helpful in education. With a Skype translator, it all starts just as with any other Skype call. You just call someone. But now the difference is the person you're calling doesn't have to speak your language. But I wanted to talk to you about the email that I sent you yesterday. Do you need any changes? There was one thing, though. Could you change the green to a lighter shade? Könnten Sie das Grün durch einen helleren Farbton ändern? Ja, wir können das Grün viel heller machen. Yes, we can make the green much brighter. Ich sende dir heute Abend eine neue Datei. I'm sending you a new file tonight. That sounds great. I look forward to it. Das klingt toll. With the Skype translator, it's a full human-to-human -human interaction that crosses the language barrier. It's truly a magical experience. So can you imagine there's going to be a whole new generation of people going online and will be using Skype uh, with this translation also. This is going to be released before the end of the year uh, by Microsoft. So uh, World Reader, which is a non-profit startup in Barcelona and San Francisco, is distributing Kindles in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa. So they do deals directly with schools, with Ministry of Education, and they work with Amazon to uh, distribute the Kindles in the classrooms. So uh, they have tremendous statistics already of like how these children use the Kindle uh, once they go out of school. They, dis they share it with the whole family, and the device is actually on 24 hours. So they also read uh, less books of what they have to read in schools, but they have more interest and they read more of the books that they have in their interest field. So Fatih Project in Turkey is going to distribute 16 million tablets yeah, to schools in, in Turkey, so which is uh, also of high interest for Apple and Google to start negotiating with the government. But there will be more and more uh, countries that go straight to education and smart classes and smart type of education through uh, technology. So we're moving more and more to education as a service. Yeah, so many of the educational packets and knowledge will become available online for free or payable and anybody in the world can basically will be able to literally learn anything. So in games and entertainment, connected networks or connected gaming uh, is, a, is a huge trend. This trend is going on uh, for a while already and start, uh, keeps increasing. Mainly also do games through mi uh, like Minecraft, yeah, which is used by already very young ch uh, children from age 3 to 4, 5, 6, 7, yeah, up to 77, yeah, where children can build with very little things. They can build their own house, their own universe, uh, and so on. The company got bought by Microsoft last week for two and a half billion. Uh, and Facebook, they bought the Oculus uh, Rift, which is basically this augmented reality mask where you can actually plunge in real time in your game. So these are all apps and, and applications that need huge data, and they love to do it, playing it together with other people over the network or through the network. In health, one of the very exciting areas uh, for the coming years. There's basically a lot of innovation in, uh, through telemedicine. The connected ambulance also, so ambulances will be connected uh, in real time to the emergency issues. Uh, um, operations, sur uh, uh, surgeon or uh, surgical operations in real time over the net. And also, they can be followed by many students in the world uh, live. This uh, doctor, for example, in the UK, 
he used Google Glass to do an operation of a liver patient, and he broadcasted live uh, to 13,000 other students using Google Glass. And the students could interact with the doctor while he was doing the operation. So they could ask him questions while they could see basically what was happening. So these type of technologies, Google Glass, I don't see a big future yet uh, for consumers because I think it's too disruptive, but there will be lots of applications in businesses or health and medical that these type of applications will work and be very useful. Um, how many of you did a DNA sample already? Oh, wow. So I did my DNA test a couple of years ago in Silicon Valley. There's this company called 23andMe where you can do a DNA test for, I think it's a bit over $100 now. Yeah, and then you can connect to a social network where actually people with the same genes or the same type of risk for diseases you can connect to and can exchange information. So th these type of networks are going to be the social networks of the future that are actually going to be very help helpful to prevent uh, things. If you know already that um, your DNA uh, identity has a risk for certain types of cancers or certain type of diseases. So uh, DNA and all the biomedics, is, there's a lot of innovation there. This is the bionic ear, the first bionic ear, which has actually been be 3D printed with cells and cartilage yeah, from a human being. So, and then they connected some type of uh, uh, audio a mechanism in there that it, the, the, the ear can actually hear already. Uh, regenerative medicine, I think this is in the University of Princeton in the US, where they have been experimenting already with that, where they can regenerate organs yeah, from human tissue. And they have been implanting these organs into humans, and they are still alive. Yeah, some of them are still alive. So this is the, med the medicine of the future, where Actually, they can regenerate from human tissue and your own organs. Internet of Things, one of the exciting areas for you guys, I guess. So this is a very interesting chart from uh, M2M, uh, from uh, Beacom Research, on connected, uh, connected things. So you can see literally all the industries there. Yeah, sorry, my thing doesn't work here. Oh, yeah. So all the industries. Yeah, the application groups, the service sectors, locations, and devices. So in any area, there will be connected devices. Some examples. Uh, Telefonica did a, a deal to provide all the smart meters in the UK. Yeah? So smart meters will be running a lot more efficient and also will be preventing CO2 or emissions and things like that in the future. Intel. Jasper, Cisco, all the big companies that have Internet of Things platforms where you actually can connect your product or your service to things or to the platform of things. One of the most interesting is General Electrics in the US that have this uh, strategy on uh, the industrial inter internet, yeah, where they basically want to connect uh, large businesses to big data and analyze that and use those analytics to become more efficient. Telemedicine is one of them. Others are like uh, wind, uh, the wind turbines can be, when they are connected, they could be more efficient, yeah? Uh, changing automatically to the wind directions. Another use is also that uh, the workers on the field, when they could come and when there's a, a troubleshooting or problem to solve, they will work with devices that will have live video, live streamed video, so they can actually uh, connect with their base to uh, solve the problem, to troubleshoot that. Nest, which was bought by Google last year, is interesting, not just because of the thermostat, but because it has algorithms that will detect the behaviors of the users. Yeah, and from these algorithms and from that data, we learn more and we can provide, or provide better products. Philips. Uh, with the light bulb, the LED light bulb, which you can use to color the light shape of the, of the bulb. Yeah? So you can change all from an app. You can change any type of mood in, 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 in your different rooms in, the, in your house. And this one from Telspec, 
is a scanner that actually is going to scan food on its um, composition. Yeah, so you will be able to analyze sugars, glucose, uh, vitamins, and, and so on, and calories. These things will become more and more available in any type of... Uh, I saw on Kickstarter there was already a campaign with a cup that will analyze what you put in it. Yeah, the coffee, lemonades, and all that, it will analyze. So there will be more and more things also that will analyze, also through the smartwatches, what we do to improve our health. Google has this device, which is basically um, an eye lens that is measuring the glucose level from diabetic pa patients. Yeah, so they can do that through the lens and through analyzing this. And this is transmitted to another device uh, to analyze the data. So there's tons of uh, devices already in wearables. Yeah, so wearables is one of the next big trends that we see and that we hear. And there's lots of devices, mainly in health or sleep tracking uh, type of devices. The Apple Watch, which was recently announced, is going to be uh, probably bringing all this technology to a larger market. Samsung is also very active on that. So uh, you can see these devices here. So they mainly track what you do. They improve your health and they make you aware of your heartbeat, uh, your, your, your blood pressure, things like that, and also your activity level. So, but there's also jewelry for ladies, yeah, technology into you know, this kind of jewelry here, this hanging piece, where you can actually pick up a call yeah, and put it in your ear. So the, the, the lady doesn't have to look anymore for the phone, or it could be more uh, practical for the ladies. So there's lots of young startups experimenting with these new type of forms. Uh, this is the biosensing clothing that is weaving, technology is weaven into the clothing to actually also track data from your body. Everything is a platform that is going to be used in retail to analyze the behavior of the users. Yeah? So, from product ID, personal ID, to personalization. But it's in the personalization, yeah, in this area, that there's a lot of value yeah, for companies to actually track the behavior of the consumers. Yeah? And that behavior can be used then to push uh, uh, notifications or promotions and things like that. Provenance is another project in the UK, which is actually tracking the origin of the product. Yeah, so if you applied this here to apples in an average supermarket store, there's about 27 different types of apples coming from different regions in the world. Yeah, so by actually labeling it with some technology, they can track where that comes from and how much transport is needed to bring that fruit to your local entity. Yeah, so just think about all the water that we're drinking is transporting from all over Europe, from all over the country, and how much that affects CO2 levels. Yeah, so all these type of technologies will impact how we think about uh, consumption and also the implications. Starbucks has the smart coffee machine already connected to the internet. So what they do, they analyze uh, the preferences from the consumers through their uh, online preferences. So they can actually track already as soon as you come in the Starbucks shop, your favorite cup of coffee that could be ready. They also use it for their uh, storage and stocking and things like that. Uh, this is Burberry shop in London, which is mainly connected. Everything starts to be connected, yeah? So they have mirrors that are being activated with Nora or RFID code that's activated in the product or in the clothing, and which you will see uh, more videos or more information about that product. They have mirrors that will give other information, can, could be personalized to the user, and all the um, uh, fashion things that are uh, shown are also the same that on the interface of the web. So this, the, the difference between web and real becomes less and less uh, different. Yeah? So it becomes a more fluid experience. And then uh, beacons, which is a technology that Apple launched last year, is now being installed in lots of retail spaces also to interact with the consumer, yeah? to track behavior and to send promotions and even do payments. So Apple Pay and the wristwatch yeah, will be the next 
uh, disruptor that people will use. Yeah, so they will not have the whole market. Android will come up with other things. Samsung will come up, but this form of payment will be very common in a couple of years' time. So the Internet of Things is really in many different sectors. You can think about examples and applications. Yeah, go into smart cities. Yeah, so the cities of the future will be built with smarter technology. So, but there are already cities that are doing that now. This is Changjing in China, which is a, an oil city, which is connected. Uh, all the transport, the emergency issues are already connected and embedded in the local system. Transport systems, bus uh, systems, parking systems, everything is already connected and can be managed by the authorities. Yeah, so to to make everything more fluid. The elderly, for example, have emergency buttons in their um, homes if there is a problem. This is the city of Mazdaq in Abu Dhabi that's currently being built that will use a lot of eco-friendly technology. This is Songdo in Seoul, which is also a smart city. It's an entirely wired. Everything, every building will be already connected with uh, high uh, technology. But in Seoul, that's also uh, this shared city network project, which has been launched by the, the city a couple of years ago, where they open up the data to the public, so literally everybody can start sharing things. They can share their bedrooms, they can share their parking spaces, they can share uh, tasks that can be used for babysitting and things like that. So, And the city is really a model for future generations of how a city can be managed and can be improved by actually sharing empty spaces. Uh, this is the Kenzo city in Nairobi that's currently being built. But another trend is also that we will have smart connected villages, yeah, because the cities will not be able to cope anymore with all the influx of people and the huge population growth. So that the other trend is that we will go out and build villages from scratch totally connected, totally networked, and green. Robotics, another exciting area. We've known robotics for many years already in car manufacturing. It has been used for a long time. Google has the self-driving car, which you all heard about. But what is uh, actually happening now, robots will become as popular as smartphones yeah, in a couple of years' time. Why? Because through artificial, uh, artificial intelligence and hardware that becomes more and uh, cheaper every day, uh, this technology becomes very uh, usable for many people. So there's lots of uh, examples. Google bought this company. You can see this one. I don't have a video here. But they really mimic already. They become more and more human, the robots. Yeah? And they can interact nearly as a human with, uh, with us. Google bought also these companies, uh, US uh, Boston Robotics, which is basically building these huge robots that are heavy duty robots for industrial, and they can go on high, um, um, high mountains and very, um, Sorry, sorry about that. So yeah, they have basically the robots to do heavy duty jobs. Yeah, they can carry weights. And uh, they are used already in industrial and by the army. There's open hardware projects everywhere. Yeah, so these hardware do-it-yourself clubs become very popular. Everybody starts uh, going to them. Uh, they have 3D printers, they have hardware available. They have access to open source. Uh, software online, so and they, all these people are starting to create things. Uh, this is the first 3D printed open source robot. And then also, um, the drone is a very popular thing that uh, you have lots of do-it-yourself clubs that are popping out now in the US. So these, uh, the drones are used also to actually travel or take a GoPro camera to start filming. Uh, things and are used in uh, lots of film and video productions. Micro robotics. Here's a short video of like what can be done already with micro robotics and how they can actually function as ants. Oh, there's no sound on this one.
It's amazing, no? So these, uh, yeah, this type of uh, micro-robots can start building micro-things and will be used also in microprocessing and building of uh, computers. So the downside is that, you know, robotics and automatization will take a lot of um, jobs also from humans, yeah? So it is predicted already by a study by Oxford uh, that 20% uh, of jobs will be lost through automatization and robotics in 10 years. Yeah, up to 50% in 20 to 25 years' time. So that is a lot. Yeah? So uh, as a society, we will have to deal with that. How we uh, you know, deal with these things and how we're going to rearrange, how we're going to spend our time and money distribution. So very interesting years ahead. 3D printer, maker movement, which is one of the, I think is the last that I'm going to show here. But it's a very exciting area. So 3D printing, a couple of years ago, nobody heard about. I saw the first 3D printing in 2011 in Silicon Valley. And then when I came back in Europe, everybody was like, 3D what? 3D printing what? Nobody heard about it. Uh, and there's a lot uh, happening in that area. Yeah? So uh, you can basically 3D print anything now. You can use any type of plastic, metals, uh, from copper to gold, or used to print uh, things. And they are used or, uh, by NASA for satellites, or from big to replace parts in big telescopes, up to sugar printing and food printing, which I will show you, and also jewelry and fashion. So again, all these 3D printers are used in these fab labs, yeah, open source type of open resources labs that are spreading everywhere on the planet the major cities. This is the 3D Hub Network, which is an Amsterdam uh, startup that started a year ago with 500 3D printers to basically, uh, they collect all the, the 3D prints in the world and they put them on a platform. Yeah, so they have now over 7,000 3D printers already. So anybody can connect to that network. You look for the 3D, the nearest 3D printer in your area. You choose your design and you can actually 3D print. And they have a sharing revenue model yeah, with the 3D printer owner. Yeah, so this is, you know, networks that are developing very fast. They come out of the blue, and just by connecting all these machines, you get a lot of possibilities. Uh, but in, even in Africa, they, they built uh, 3D printers. This is Afate Gniku in Togo. Uh, what they do is actually the dump that we do of all the old computers uh, in the Western world, we dump it in Africa. Yeah, and probably some other places too. So all the old uh, printers, desktop computers, they are dumped over there. So what the people do, the locals there, they start actually taking out the pieces that they can use again. Yeah, so all the elements that they can use and they build a 3D printer. They build a 3D printer w for less than $100. Yeah, they use some elements that they had to uh, buy online but that's a 3D printer for less than $100. So basically, anybody in the world can start building machines, yeah? building hardware to serve a purpose. Yeah? And this is happening all over. Uh, service platforms or marketplaces, as we call them. This is iMaterialize in Belgium, which is one of the most popular, where anybody with a 3D printer design, you can put it online, and then other people can actually buy it, and they also have a shared revenue model. But even UPS is now offering 3D printed services in the US already uh, to startups and entrepreneurs and small businesses because one of the biggest uh, parts of their business is actually replacement of hardware parts that they have to transport from one city to another. So they figured if they can just 3D print those pieces, the customer will be better served. And here's Jimmy from Intel. I don't know if you heard about him. He's going to introduce robot himself. we've been developing in our uh, one of our research labs, and Jimmy is powered by a Core i7 Nook, which is a commercially available uh, computing platform. Hi, Walt. I'm Jimmy the Robot. I'm a two-foot-tall, high-end humanoid research robot. I was made in just two weeks using open-source software and applications, as well as a 3D printer. Yeah, so Intel is launching this basically as a commercial option. Yeah, so the 3D printed parts can be uh, printed, uh, or you can find the designs online for free, but then Intel sells the microprocessors and the elements to actually construct a robot. I think this now costs $1,600, but they aim to uh, release that for under $1,000 very soon. 
So and lots of these robots will come to market. There's lots of other brands already also releasing their own robots. So this is going to be an explosion in the coming years. So other 3D printer applications are in houses. In China, they have already technology where they can print 3D print 10 houses in a series. Uh, this is another project in the US where actually they experiment also with the matter. Yeah, like this is a matter of salt and cement that they mix together to, to create this new type of form. So there will be lots of new forms in architecture that we can use like this. And then also create to create new experiences of forms and light and shades. Very interesting. Fashion. Yeah, this is from a Dutch designer, so I don't know if it's very handy or cozy for the ladies, but you know, it is uh, nice to make an impression if you go out in the evening. So and there's tons of these type of examples, very creative examples of 3D printing, shoes, jewelry, and then uh, fashion. Uh, this lady just launched a startup where she actually wants to uh, disrupt the, um, the makeup business. $55 billion business. Yeah, so to, so she, she's focusing on uh, the target, the young target of 16 to 22 year old uh, girls, so they can print their own makeup. Yeah, so they can literally pick any type of color, put it on uh, a Photoshop application, and then print out lipstick or other type of uh, makeup. So these type of technologies are coming to market and will, of course, uh, be uh, very interesting to follow. Uh, 3D printed food. I don't know if you heard about this is 3D printed sugar from Sugar Labs. Yeah, so they can print basically anything now. Yeah, so they can use colors and create new forms and lots of exciting things up to this uh, wonderful cake here. Uh, 3D printing fruit. This is Dovetailed, which is a startup in Cambridge, which is actually using spherification, molecular spherification, to recreate fruit. So they can extract, uh, you know, sugars and replace them with other tastes and things like that. So this is now used also by the biggest chefs in the world. Uh, this is going to become a trend. And then SpaceX is going to send a 3D printer to the International Space Station so it can actually start printing its own replacement parts. So there's a lot of excitement ahead. I'm going to start here, uh, stop here. We always overestimate the changes that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the changes that will occur in the next 10. So I forgot to mention that don't let yourself be lulled into inaction because you are the guys who make all this happen. And you know, through technology and the optical networks, we can create lots of nice images as these here, which are taken by a, a robot that is actually having a GoPro camera and uh, transmitting these images live to the internet. Have a look. Thank you.